بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اللہ تعالیٰ نے قرآن میں سور الرحمن میں کہا ہے کہ فب ائی آلائے ربکم تشرکون فب ائی آلائے ربکم تشرکون یعنی وچ آف دا فیورز آف یور لارڈ ول یو ڈینائی سو ایکچولی دس لائف از اباؤٹ اپریشیٹنگ ایوری مومنٹ دیٹ وی ہیو وی ہیو ویری فیو مومنٹس دیٹ ہیو بین گیون ٹو اس اینڈ ایچ آف دم از اے ٹریمنڈس ٹریجر اینڈ اپریشیشن کمز ود انڈرسٹینڈنگ دا کریشن آف اللہ سو نالج واز گیون ٹو اس Allah Ta'ala starts by the surah by saying Allam al-Quran, the most precious knowledge. So there is one type of knowledge which is permanent. And then there is the world which is ever-changing. Every moment is new. So life is about taking this eternal knowledge and applying it to the moment which is always new. So this idea of ishtahad, every moment you have to do ishtahad because the... Um, Deen is permanent, but the world is uh, always new. So you, there is nothing, I mean, you cannot use past experience to decide. So you have to creatively uh, apply Deen. So Deen is not I- inherited. So Ibrahim salam argues with his people that uh, why do you obey the, um, why do you worship these idols? Do they bring you any profit? Do they bring you any harm? So the Qaam says no. We, we haven't seen this, but our parents used to do this. So he says, okay, well, if your parents were wrong, then why should you follow them? So our deen is also something not which cannot be learned by habit. It has to be come from inside. You can't follow Islam just because your parents used to do it. It's, it's meaningless. It has to, you have to learn it from scratch, just like the son of a doctor cannot become a doctor. just because uh, of inheritance. So, Islam is not something inherited. It has to be learnt. And it's a difficult and deep and complex learning. And if you don't do it, and if you just do everything according to what everybody else is doing, which is what is happening, then you are, and you, there are so many people who are, believe themselves to be sincere Muslims, and they think that killing is a part of Islam, which is completely wrong, and has, has no, really, I mean, it's actually a, insult uh, one of the uh, arguments they said you know he did tawheen rasalat i said you are doing bigger tawheen rasalat by thinking that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would endorse such a thing that you are uh, insulting our prophet by associating such an action with him and also you are uh, insulting islam by think by making other people think that this is what islam is about which is so Allah Ta'ala has given us many blessings and the greatest blessing is the deen of Islam. But unfortunately, like uh, the hadith said that Islam came as a stranger and will become a stranger. So today what the real Islam is, is a stranger to Muslims. So, um, to start our lesson today, uh, we are going to give a very short history of time, from the beginning of time to World War II, which is when Polanyi was writing at the end of World War II. And um, so <coughs> only the, of course, this is a huge period of time. We're only going to look at the economic structures. So <coughs> the first culture that emerged was the hunter-gatherer. Uh, basically, uh, people go and uh, look at the bounties of nature, what Allah Ta'ala has provided directly. So they get the fruits which are growing or the nuts or animals. So actually depending on the location, different types of strategies because the Mother Earth is very bountiful and provides for everyone differently. So and people were living in Uh, Arctic and so they were building houses out of ice and they were uh, snow and they were hunting uh, fishes and bears. Uh, in Africa insects were uh, uh, being eaten and um, in different environments there was hunting, fishing, gathering wild foods and basically um, they were um, 
using a variety of strategies to get a balanced diet. So now the thing is that this is the economic structure. Now this economic structure imposes a political structure and a social structure. There is some, there is an harmony between these things, and that is what crucial to understand because one of the, you see, um, modern economics is really about putting on blindfolds so that uh, you cannot see the reality in front of you. So one of the blindfolds is that economics can be studied in isolation from politics and society. It cannot be. All three are interlinked and so we have to study all three together and it's easier to see the connections in simple societies because more complicated. And, but, but if you follow the transition, then you um, get deeper understanding. So <clears throat> there was a huge variety of these cultures in the Indians and the... Um, so one of the economic requirements is that this kind of society it cannot survive in a, in a small place because you need a large number of resources. So basically they calculate that you need about 1300 square kilometers so it means that you have to be nomadic. You can't stay in one place. So cities and towns cannot emerge. They cannot emerge anyway because um, basically uh, um, you can't have a concentration of people in one place because the food requirement will not be met. So um, uh, so a lot of uh, the structure of the society is forced by the environment. You have small groups of people which form tribes and they are, uh, they wander around the land looking for food and animals. So uh, one of the conditions of this is that your housing must be simple. So you make tents or uh, simple uh, things. Social groups are small. Um, because of this um, transportation needs and you need small bands so you have interchanges you have uh, so this this is a kind of pattern that has been observed there are um, in society and you can see that it is natural this is what the economic requirements produce this kind of society now as opposed to this Adam Smith starts by writing that man has a natural propensity to truck, barter, and trade, <coughs> which is absolutely false. Now, the reason I'm saying is, th is this, that there is, if you look at the real history of, and you look at the mythical history, there's a big difference. What Adam Smith is trying to do is to say that market society is a natural uh, society. And what Polanyi says is exactly the opposite. He says market society is extremely unnatural. It's an artificial imposition upon humanity by force and so actually um, barter I will give you this you will give me this is an adversarial trans transaction in which our interests are opposed to each other I want to get the most out of you I want to give you the least so it's not a human uh, social transaction as opposed to this the natural transaction which takes place among human beings and which is very common is gift exchange which I give you this gift but it is not worthy of you this is what you say that my gift is not and uh, so um, in the um, certain types of <coughs> also in other types of society the gift giving was the sign of the, the chief the chief of the tribe everyone would provide uh, things, uh, uh, shares from their hunt to the chief, it was the right of the chief. And then the chief was supposed to distribute because he had all of these things. And so the giving of the gift was a sign of his being the chief and the taking of the gift was a sign of your being in a lower status. So. Um, <clears throat> In those kind of societies, this ultimatum game was played all across the world by anthropologists to see how it works. And in those societies, the 
One person would give everything to the other and the other person would refuse. <laughs> because giving everything is the sign of being the chief and accepting is the sign of being... So, so this uh, is completely opposite of the utility maximization prediction. <laughs> 100% opposite. So this is something which can happen. So the pattern of human behavior is the, the selfish pattern is actually a market pattern which is <coughs> which is does exist in market societies to some extent but it is not a natural pattern and not common pattern so this is very important to understand because it's something which nobel prize winning uh, economists don't understand <coughs> that there is a conflict between social and market motives so if we are uh, giving donating blood for example and if you say okay we'll give you some money for it so the um, economists uh, said that yes there is a natural desire and this will add to the monetary incentive so the two will uh, combine so if you offer money uh, there is a natural desire to help and also uh, so that will be uh, furthered but actually when it was done in experiments and you can easily see because everybody here is a human being not a robot <coughs> except for a few people who become so conditioned by economics that uh, they start thinking like economists. So, uh, so you see that if we are offered money, uh, then this becomes a market transaction. Then it's not uh, a transaction which is meant for social service. So actually they have done experiments uh, to confirm and, and so it's very possible that if you offer money, the total amount of blood supply will go down. Suppose we were to run an experiment out here and set up a stand where you will get 100 rupees or 1000 rupees for a pint of blood. Well, very, very few people will donate and those who are sort of in desperate need of money, only they will donate. Otherwise, people will say, I don't want to sell my blood for money. On the other hand, if you said, okay, there is an um, emergency and uh, some uh, hadsa has happened and we need blood supplies, everybody will go and uh, happily help that, okay, we we'll like to help. So the social motive and the market motive, they are in conflict with each other. Uh, lots of experiments prove this and this is very surprising and to economists and this has great implications because all of the theory of labor in economists is studied, uh, there is a, a whole branch of literature, all of these books can be thrown in the garbage which is about uh, contracts and uh, incentive compatibility. In fact, my friend Ben Thomstrom, his, his thesis, his PhD, his uh, Nobel Prize is based on this kind of work uh, about uh, yani devising contracts which will induce the worker to put in the right amount of labor by offering him money for when he works and taking uh, any punishments for when he does not work. You know, this is ridiculous. I mean, it doesn't work. In, in reality, if you trust the person, you say that, okay, please do this job for me. I'm relying on you. He will do the job. And if you say, okay, I'll pay you so much if you do it and I will punish you by this much, he will not do it. He will feel resentful that, and angry. Uh, why are you uh, doing this to me? This is not uh, a good treatment. I'm not a machine. So... Uh, this is all, of course, Western concept. In Islam, we have even higher concepts, which, as I said, Muslims have forgotten, that when we do service to people, we don't expect thanks from them. We don't ask them to thank us, and we don't expect any reward or appreciation from them, because we want our appreciation and reward only from Allah. Now, today, Muslims don't have that. They want both. They want the, yes, the person, if I do something favor to somebody, he should be grateful to me, and also, of course, I will get my reward from Allah. This doesn't work like that. <laughs> so this is the, in the West, you see, you have these uh, uh, charity plate dinners where you come. Because the, in the West, they cannot conceive of the idea that people really want to do charity. So they say, okay, we'll give you a thousand dollar plate dinners. So at least you get something. And now in Islam, this is very, very bad. Because now if you get a plate of food for your thousand dollars, then... See, a uh, mixture of intention is not allowed. You, it's either purely for the sake of Allah or for the plate. And you can't say, okay, 500 is for Allah and 500 is for my dinner. <laughs> so this is not, doesn't work like that. 
So, but this is something that is outside of the range of Western experience. They don't understand this at all. <coughs> there was a man um, here from working on uh, for Quaker charity, and he was here to do refugee relief some time ago. He said, you know, I'm heading this, and I wanted to do this completely on a volunteer basis. So, but they said, no, this is not professional, so they are paying me a salary to do this work. So. Because they because they think that people won't work without salary, or if they work, they will be sloppy and inefficient because volunteers. But uh, this is not actually true. <coughs> so today we are going to talk about some aspects of the great uh, transformation by Polanyi, and so I'm going to uh, just uh, outline the sketch. Um, so basically. Uh, we had the transformation from, as, as you go along, you see, from the nomadic society, you go to the, um, there was an agricultural revolution. So people <coughs> started, learned how to cultivate land and to produce things. Uh, and they uh, started to, uh, when they started staying in one place, see, there was this uh, dynamic that uh, a nomadic society can't stay in one place, so you can't uh, uh, mm, you can't uh, sow crops. So eventually, some people domesticated animals and they domesticated plants, and uh, then um, they started growing food. And actually, um, when they started growing food, they started staying in one place. Actually, this was uh, not a good development in the sense that. Uh, human uh, nutrition went down actually you, you, they traced the anthropologists that the uh, they can look at the skull development and the skull bone and they see that the hunter gatherers were doing but much they had a much uh, richer variety of food domestication initially at least led to a loss but there was more um, security and some other advantages so uh, <coughs> the nomadic societies turned up into the villages and towns and uh, then because they were uh, settled in one place they had an impact on the land itself the geography was changed they started cultivating they uh, cut down forests they irrigated the land So, but this led to extensive surplus food which is what is needed for a town to come into existence and when you have surplus food then a lot of things can happen some people can now afford to do something other than food production so then you get art and you get literature and you get uh, um, uh, architecture uh, when you have not everybody is gathering food then there can be hierarchies um, you can have military so a lot of things came into existence now we're not I'm not trying to study history here I'm just trying to show how the economic relations of production lead to certain natural outcomes and so none of this can come out of a utility maximization theory but this is real world economics. Now, see in, in uh, economic theory when you study you say okay, there's Robinson Crusoe <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, imaginary economics and it doesn't work like that. I mean you look at real history then you get real lessons. So this is a map of the world which shows how uh, basically uh, the blue lines are uh, water courses which run sometimes underneath the oceans also. So these uh, major, uh, basically the green eras are, are the places where civilization first emerged because there was um, lots of land easily available for agriculture. I mean we had agricultural society in uh, Medina as well but it was a desert agriculture which is subsistence agriculture, it doesn't produce a lot of surplus so you can just barely survive. But where you had a lot of surplus, there you had civilization because now people could do other things. 
different from the production of food. So a quick sequence of developments is that first we got hunter-gatherer society, then we got agricultural society, which started producing surplus. And one of the most important things that you can do with surplus is develop military and then steal other people's <laughs> agriculture. So uh, once you have military, then you have uh, uh, this uh, tension between those people who are growing, the farmers who don't have military skills, and the military who doesn't have food. So then you have this, uh, this kind of a city-state emerged. This is a natural development again. There's a group of people in the city which have army and in the outlying lands nearby the city you have the farmers. The farmers are protected by the city. In return they supply food to the city. Of course within the city then you get artisans, people who are producing other kinds of products, more complicated. And these things, uh, then they, they can be trade, they can... So, um, uh, the city-state uh, turned out that when multiple cities combine, they can uh, overrun any city-state. So the nations emerged. And when the nations emerged, then they could produce huge surplus amounts. And this was a big problem because what do you do with this huge surplus? I mean, a natural society is a subsistence economy in which everybody produces food only for consumption. Consumption is not the purpose of life. Now, if you have a huge amount of surplus, then you have to get rid of it. So there is, who will buy it? So there is this Say's law. Say's law is actually a psychological law. It uh, soothes you that don't worry about surplus. Somebody else other will buy it. Don't, um, I mean, people will be concerned. We are producing, how can, can there be a glut? I mean, you produce thousands of things. There are no buyers. How can, what will happen to it? So, um, one of the things that happened was that the surplus can support massive military. So once you have huge surplus, you get huge military and you can conquer the world. And uh, you can create markets by force. Because of, so all over the world, they were societies, they were living happily in a subsistence economy. I mean, now people say that they were primitive. Actually, the thing is that the societies were I mean, not geared to production of food as an object of life. They were doing a lot of other things which were, if you look at roots, then you find that the people who are uh, the African tribes, they had a lot of different types of skills and arts and, uh, but they were not devoted to the surplus production of goods, which was not the object of life. So these societies, uh, the market society has this dynamic that it can expand because it has a lot more power than the traditional society. So, um, um, the um, European societies, once they industrialized, then they colonized the world. And for a hundred years, the world was big enough to uh, be con colonized and they didn't fight each other for reasons that are very important in the story of Polanyi. But eventually they exhausted the world. The world was finished and now uh, then they started fighting each other because again the question is what to do with all the surplus. So uh, they had massive militaries and they wanted to do adventure now. So the war was a sort of a natural consequence although uh, one thing that we are differing, you see Marx had the idea that these things follow laws, that there are certain laws which occur. And there are no laws. I mean, we have control of our destiny. There is some tendency towards that, but it can be avoided. Allah Ta'ala says, Hadayna hun najdain. We have shown them both the ways, the pathway of evil and the pathway of good, and you can choose. At all points, choices are available. But you can understand why uh, certain things might happen. So, uh, basically, the story that Polanyi begins his book with, and that's what we are going to do, the first part, not part two. So the first part goes up to World War II, and uh, basically he says that the first World War, we discussed how there are four institutions that were uh, the underlying 
um, characteristics of uh, 19th century Europe. So basically he says the primary cause of, of World War I was the breakdown of the balance of powers which we will see and we the secondary cause was that um, as we saw towards the end of the uh, 19th century basically 1897 or so there was a return to um, um, protectionism so the free trade ideas which were dominant towards the last half were starting to have their show their adverse effects and this is a main theme of Polanyi that the market wants to expand but it harms everybody by its expansion and people try to protect themselves so for about 20 years Europe experimented with free trade saw the bad effects and slowly uh, started to protect itself by increasing protection so by uh, 1903 or 1905 uh, we had fairly closed economy. As a result, the um, uh, trade relations became less significant, less important. And so the financial interests in protecting trade was not powerful enough uh, to maintain peace when the balance of power collapsed. Uh, and there was also one more thing that was the cause of World War II that about a century of peace among the European powers led them to misunderstanding about the nature of war. So far they had been fighting primitive cultures and conquering easily and they had avoided fighting each other. So they did not have a conception of what would happen when they started fighting each other. So actually to call it a World War is a is a Eurocentric name and um, it should be a war between the European powers which engaged the whole planet because the uh, whole planet was under the dominance of the West. So he says that uh, by the towards the end of the 19th century uh, which was the start of the return to closed economies there was a globally interlinked market economy and uh, the government all the governments were making their budgets for the year and so on and it all depended on currency and credit availability like today when we make the budget which is coming up then the government will consider how much revenue it has what are the spendings and what are the loans in fact a third of the budget goes in interest payments to loans and a uh, third of budget goes to war and in defense only a third is available for development and this is a very significant thing and it's possible to eliminate those two thirds by reorganizing the economic system but it is uh, the whole of the mythology of economics is very powerful and people don't think outside of the system say given this system this is what must be done the fact the system itself is a very bad system and there are other alternatives available is not uh, something which is even visible to people because of the blinders that are created by economic theory. So we are talking here about the end of 19th century so what Polanyi is saying is that we had at that time 20 years of free trade in Europe had led to a very interlinked economy. So because one of the features of the market economy which is very drastically different from the pre-market economy is that in pre-market economy self-sufficiency is very important you don't want to depend on uh, buying food from others because how can you trust the market if the ship goes down then I will starve so you want to make sure that you're growing your own food but in the market economy this doesn't happen and uh, so you depend on food so the food prices depend on the international markets which can fluctuate up and down so whether or not you have enough to eat depends on what's happening in the international market so um, so what he is saying is that the international economic system was the axis of the material existence everybody understands that now uh, 
our food depends on international economic system and so everybody wants to make sure that this is uh, in operational and so this international economic system meaning European economic system needed peace in order to function okay, uh, and uh, the balance of power was made to serve this peace interest as we said the balance of power operated differently in the 19th century but he says that if the system would disappear then the peace interest would also dis disappear it is a, it was not the primary thing the, it is not the instinct of human beings uh, the, for peace loving that was driving the system it was the system that was driving the peace so um, there was a breakdown in the balance of powers uh, through uh, historical events the Germany Italy and Austria Hungary uh, formed a triple alliance with uh, a treaty that if anybody attacks any of us, all of us will go to the aid. This is actually a formalization. Now in the original bands of powers, everyone is unaligned and everybody aligns themselves with the weaker power to make sure that nobody becomes too strong. Now by formalizing a triple alliance, you are creating a problem with the original balance of powers configurations. Uh, one of the sharpest uh, politicians of the 19th century Bismarck, he thought that uh, France and uh, Russia are on the opposite sides of Germany. And so one of their permanent worries was that if both of them attack us, then we will be forced to split our armies and it will be a difficult, we can only give half our army to protect. Uh, so, um, but when they aligned, then France and Germany have been traditionally enemies fighting centuries of war. As I said, these are savage uh, people, never actually learned how to be civilized up till this day. Um, so, um, France was felt threatened by this. And so they started negotiations and uh, in 1894 they uh, put together a secret agreement that if uh, anyone is attacked by Germany then uh, we will go to their aid by attacking on the other side which will make sure split. Now of course this was actually secret because they didn't want to find out but the um, uh, Germany found this out and they felt threatened uh, at the same time uh, in 1904 this is I mean not quite in chronolo chronological order but in 1904 Britain and France came to a peace treaty and in 1907 there was the triple entente which, which, which is uh, uh, an understanding so the understanding was actually informal it was not actually a military treaty like the alliance but uh, it had the same effect. Now Germany was caught between the pincers that okay France and Russia have made a military alliance and if at any time they choose to attack then uh, we will be in big trouble and uh, there was every reason to expect an attack in the sense that history said that uh, European history says that if you are powerful enough to attack you should there is no any there's no morality involved and if you can if you this the law of the jungle if you can conquer then it is your duty and right to conquer so once they have the power then germany had to look out for its defense so the german uh, military put together this brilliant plan that uh, was amazingly complicated the schleifen plan and it's uh, basically um, the French had a, uh, there was a natural line of invasion which Germany had. So they said, no, we won't go, go through the natural line, we will go around it. So they went up into Belgium and then down from an, another route to create a pincer attack on, uh, on uh, France. Uh, there was a vast movement of troops for coming from different sides and caught in a very complex pattern that was the design. So. Initially, when the German prince was uh, wanted this, 
And then at some point he said uh, he, uh, he, he became frightened of what might happen. Uh, going through Belgium was a problem because uh, Belgium's neutrality was guaranteed by Great Britain. And so uh, attack in and, and Germany didn't want to offend Britain. It wanted to just conquer France with minimum intervention. But it had to go through Germany. So at any point, at some point, um, Kaiser, uh, the king of Germany, decided to stop. But the, at that time, the German army chief said that now it's uh, it's in motion and we have put hundreds of orders and armies are marching in different directions. We can't call it off. So, on the one side there was this triple entente between Britain, France and Russia. On the other side we had this triple alliance between Austria, Hungary and Germany and uh, what was the third country? Italy, yes. So, now actually Austria felt quite secure. They were very powerful. Serbia was a small country. They wanted to eat it up as usual. So, uh, what happened is that uh, they had to send somebody, Archduke Ferdinand, who to Serbia for some diplomatic mission and um, he was kidnapped by some students. <laughs> so, uh, they, they had some own uh, agenda, which was some minor little thing, but somehow or the other in the middle, uh, Duke was killed, uh, which was purely an accident. And this is the thing that sparked the world war. But the thing is that um, it was not just the assassination. Actually, Serbia agreed to all the demands that they had made. But Austria Hungary felt that now I have backing of Germany and uh, I, uh, we are individual. So it was just an excuse. Like the, it was like the famous story of the goat and the lion. She says, you are polluting the water. He, she says, so the goat says that, well, uh, I am downstream. <laughs> he says, no, it must have been your mother. She polluted the water. <laughs> so anyway, there's some excuses needed to attack. So, so they did. So they attacked Serbia and that was the event. And then basically things got out of hand. I mean lots of people wanted to stop but the events were set in motion that were so large that nobody could call a halt like the Germany Kaiser wanted to stop the war but it was too late. Uh, also psychologically because they, everybody was prepared for the upcoming war for some reason. So France, uh, in 1878, you see, Germany had um, conquered Alsace and Lorraine. They were two uh, very highly productive areas of France. And uh, France wanted revenge for this and it wanted to recapture them. So there was every excuse for them. And so they wanted, they had put in a plan already, they had how to reconquer. Germany had this Schleifen plan. And uh, the Russians thought that if we have a war, it's glorious and it brings honor and glory to the empire. And England wanted to weaken Germany and wanted to, I mean, the colonies were uh, in Africa were uh, the target for England. So everybody was interested in the war. And um, everybody thought that this would be a surgical strike, uh, quick operation. So when the war broke out, people were celebrating and cheering and everybody thought that, you know, we have a wonderful army and we are going to win very quickly. Each nation's army would occupy the enemy's capital by Christmas <laughs> and uh, if uh, people didn't enlist now, they would miss out on all the fun and glory. And nobody realized what was about to happen, which is the bloodiest war in all of human history up to that time. But uh, underneath this, this is what uh, Polanyi says, underneath the apparent configurations there was this uh, um, fact that in, uh, basically he says that in 1907 the, uh, was um, the balance of power broke down when the Triple Islands was 
uh, Triple Entente was concluded, and so there, were, there were only two parties. And now in two parties, you only have war. There is no balancing available anymore. Uh, but underlying also the fact was that the economies had become much more closed, which meant that the financial interest in preserving the peace had become less. So you have uh, the, the, the financial interest was never peace directly, but peace for profits. So you always have two ways to win, make a profit. Either you can conquer the enemy and just get everything, which is a huge profit, or you can trade and get less profit. So if at some point the calculation shows that we can just win and conquer a whole country, that's a huge profit. So again, now the profit interest is no longer to preserve the peace. So there was the reduced peace interest, there's the underlying love of war and conquest, which is part of the European heritage. Um, everyone had a brilliant plan which would quickly succeed and actually all of those plans succeeded simultaneously. So <laughs> there was a, uh, nearly succeeded. So there was this yani, massive destruction all over. The France really punished Germany by hugely. Germany punished France and the yani, and, uh, destruction of Europe. So one of the factors that is not mentioned is that the mm, basically the um, this is another book that capitalism relies on exploitation of a resource and ultimately it finishes that resource. So one of the uh, at that time in the early 18th century the world was an open resource and so they went out to conquest and while the resource was freely available they converted basically all of the world was harnessed into the capitalist machine you had human beings living uh, functional societies these were all yani, destroyed and, and uh, converted into subunits of the capitalist machinery so the workers in uh, india which were producing their own industry they were uh, they were uh, deprived of their industry and they were turned into uh, units to produce raw materials to feed the factories in, uh, in england and this was actually also the theory in all cases you see you have to pursue, to understand history, you have to pursue the two strands simultaneously. There are events taking place and then there are ideas which are driving the events. And so the idea of free trade, the idea of comparative advantage, the idea that India must be a producer of raw materials, this is their comparative advantage. This is a completely ridiculous theory. It has no connection to reality. But it has a connection to the conquest. That, okay, so whenever uh, attempts were made and many attempts were made to produce industrial production in uh, India. In fact, uh, there was a huge amount of knowledge and talent here which still exists. Alhamdulillah. Uh, people discovered the steam engine uh, indigenously uh, some 50 years after it was invented in England. This is an amazing accomplishment because England was 50 years ahead of everybody else, Europe. and. Uh, we rediscovered it, but of course it was a crude engine first attempt to, 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 if, if we had, but the point is that actually industry develops by, it's not just technology, there's a, it has to be built into the culture. This is very important that the uh, science uh, uh, grew into the culture, there were scientific societies, ordinary people talking about science in Europe, so that's what led to the progress. Now science as an alien export doesn't uh, unless you take root unless people understand what this is and how it will help and this is how it grew in Islamic societies also I mean it has to grow naturally out of problems that are f we are facing if we are facing certain problems and we find solutions by using technology and this was done throughout the history of Islam in fact uh, one of the links I have put on recently shows that you know when uh, there was an agriculture revolution Coincident with the conquest of Islam when in the 7th century when Muslims took over a large portion of the world, they created a revolution in agriculture because they had uh, uh, a better understanding of how to get the fruits of the land. So, 
anyway when the europe exhausted the globe then uh, again now uh, there is also an another problem that basically as your uh, produce expands you seek uh, markets for it but when you're exploiting these markets then their ability to buy your food uh, diminishes so there is this tension between the desire to increase profits and the possibility uh, this is exactly uh, this is a sort of a version of what the basic thesis of Karl Marx was that there is an inherent contradiction in ma Marxism that as you try to increase profits you exploit workers more and more but then you lead, uh, le reach a limit which forces you to stop your exploitation but the capitalism system is such that it can't uh, it can't survive on um, on st stability it has to keep increasing so it leads to a crisis so uh, when the resource is exhausted uh, the possibility of making more profits is exhausted then uh, something has to give there is a crisis and the crisis was resolved by the war so um, this is sort of a partial explanation of the factors that led to world war one now we go following um, uh, Polanyi's analysis from the period uh, World War I was 1914 to 1918 and World War II was 1942 so the period between the World War is the 20s and the 30s and these two decades were of importance and basically um, what Polanyi says is that the, in the period of 20s there was an effort tried to put back together Humpty Dumpty which had fallen down and broken into several pieces. The, all the four institutions that were uh, driving 19th century had somehow broken down and so there was a huge effort to try to put it back together but it failed and so in the 30s there was a revolution of sorts in the sense that new systems came into existence. So what happened after 1918? Well, Britain uh, suspended gold payments because they had acquired a huge amount of debt in the war and it was not possible for them to pay in gold. So basically, Britain being the main banker of the world, everybody else had actually pounds and if they couldn't use pounds to convert pounds, so everybody went off the gold standard. Except USA, USA had its own gold reserves. Uh, now, when do you have no gold standard, then as we have discussed, there is a huge problem with international trade. I mean, I can, uh, how can I pay you? Um, and if payments are in gold, then there is no problem. I mean, it's a universal standard, but if payments are in my currency, then the value of my currency against yours, this doesn't have any clear... Um, a determinant this idea and these concepts the monetary economy we will discuss in much greater detail later on separately because this is a very important uh, topic if you want to understand what's going on in the world now you have to understand money but uh, we will touch on it lightly first on a first round at this moment so basically you can see that there is a problem with the international trade if you don't have any common units of measurement so, and if there is a problem with trade, then in Europe there is a uh, centuries old tradition that if there is no trade, then there is war. Uh, so, uh, there were these four things we talked about. There was um, the balance of power broke down in 1907. Uh, the gold standard, oh sorry, we are talking about now the post-war period. Post-World War, what happened was the Okay, so there's no mention of treaties. Basically, post-war there were treaties which were made in which the um, losing side, Germany and Italy and uh, Austria-Hungary was dismantled. Uh, they were um, uh, they were forced to, Germany was forced to pay reparations, uh, huge amounts of payments to the victors for the damage that they had caused in the war. Uh, 
and they were disarmed they were forced to uh, uh, disband their army so that they wouldn't have any military capability so what Polari says is that this basically made it impossible to go back to the pre um, uh, war um, situation because it made sure that there can be no balance of power because one side is disarmed the other side is armed he said that this the situation which is uh, inherently unstable it cannot continue because one side has arms other one doesn't then you know what will happen in the law of the jungle that's why the US uh, before attacking Iraq they had uh, multiple inspections to make uh, to make sure that there's no weapons there anymore then they attacked and in fact there's a very interesting cartoon that um, uh, of that time uh, who is it Carter or somebody so they announced that you know the um, uh, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction so this president is looking very worried you know if we are about to attack and they have weapons of, they say, no, no 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 we just said that to the public to fool them it's not really true don't worry <laughs> so if the other side you make sure that the other side has no weapons then you can uh, invade and conquer so this is not and everybody knows this I mean Germany knew also so uh, basically um, all of the uh, there was low trade which basically meant that there is autarky because if the currencies are not stable then you can't do trade so basically you have to go back to your uh, pre trade economy which is self sufficiency you have to make sure that you have everything you need uh, no gold standard no balance of powers and so the liberal state which is designed to support the markets also broke down there was fascism on one side and so basically in the 1920s there's lots of political disturbances and Polanyi says is that okay on the surface it seems like there's lots of revolutions going on Russian revolution even this is, this is all actually reactionary all, all of these revolutions are attempts to go back to the golden past um, the system itself was uh, no longer functional the 19th century system had broken down and will no longer it's no longer possible to revive that system so for the 20s a great effort was made to put that back into place but it all failed because the because of the basic Marxist contradiction that the capitalist system is uh, designed to destroy itself it works in such a way that it cannot and it exploits and it exhausts the resource like you see uh, the function fundamental functional unit of society is the family now um, everywhere in the world the capitalist system attempts to destroy the society by turning both the man and the woman into units of production and when this happens then the family is adversely affected and today we can see the effect in Pakistan where the great transformation which took place in Europe a long time ago is now underway and nobody can rely on anybody else anymore and that is why um, girls instinctively feel that we must learn something because we can't uh, no, can no longer trust our husband <laughs> to <laughs> feed us and uh, this is the way uh, this is uh, the truth the bitter reality of today that um, uh, uh, the husband also uh, cannot trust uh, the you know, family system is is uh, breaking down so uh, in 1930s this was basically when the efforts to restore the old economy failed then uh, people abandoned the old system and decided to go to a new system so Great Britain tried to go on gold failed to do so because uh, of various technical and other difficulties and then went off gold again it was followed by the USA which also went off the gold standard uh, in Russia which was actually trying to follow the path of the West there was a revolution and 
they were trying to modernize and uh, they were trying to follow the European liberal ideology and there was a revolution and uh, the free market ideology was abandoned and instead you, they went to a planned economy which is again a violation of the free market system of the 19th century. There was the New Deal in USA which was again government heavy interference in the economy and also after the banking crisis the US introduced a lot of financial regulation. This is the story of money which we will discuss later very important story but not currently part of the Polanyi idea. In the Germany there was a socialist revolution and the League of Nations which was basically uh, put in place after World War I to try to pr preserve the peace, it collapsed because there were not enough common interests. So you need common interests. If there was a lot of trade then there is a common interest in preserve. There was no interest in preserving the peace. So. Now, when the, um, see, uh, when the trade collapsed, then there was certain tensions, which I will describe in greater detail a little bit later, but basically there was uh, maintaining stable currencies is important to international trade. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the same level of importance when you have no international trade, because domestic currency then only valuable for domestic purposes. So as a result, due to certain dynamics which we will discuss in greater detail later, there was hyperinflation of rubles, so the currency became worthless in the international market. There was hyperinflation in Germany, currency became worthless in international markets and very difficult to use in local markets. Uh, this led to the expropriation of the rentier class. The people who had a lot of money, their money became worthless. So uh, the rentier class is the one which makes money from money and they do nothing worthwhile. So actually this is actually good for the economy to destroy them. Keynes himself said that we should uh, put the interest rate at zero to destroy the rentier class because the rentier class earns, earns its wealth by using its money only and not providing any service to the economy and that harms the economy. So in Austria on the other hand they managed to uh, stabilize the currency but they destroyed their domestic economy and that is what I want to explain a little bit. Basically Every economy, in order to function, requires in a in a market economy. Now, not in a not in a, um, a pre-market economy. Pre-market economy, work functions without money. Very important characteristic. Money is not essential to survive. Money can exist in a market, non-market economy, but it's not crucial to survival because you can get your food without money. But in a market economy, you need a certain amount of money. If the money is too little then the necessary functions cannot be performed. This is basically the insight of Keynes which is rejected by uh, neoclassical economics. That if there, there is a certain optimal quantity of money, if you have too little money then the uh, economy will um, have unemployment, it will have recession because you don't have enough money to run your businesses, you run your trade, you run your shops. So you have recession. If you have too much money, that will lead to inflation. Because uh, uh, this is standard economic theory, which you know. Now the problem is that there is a dilemma. Now, if you have a closed economy, isolated from others, then you can control your money supply because you can uh, print money. And as long as the money printed, you see the ratio of your money to gold can vary. Uh, how much gold backing you have for the money is not so important. Contrary to the belief in gold standard and currently also there is lots of confusion about the nature of money and we will discuss this later on but basically the correct idea of money is that it is a fiat, it is by law. So the um, how much gold backing it has is sort of an irrelevant issue, it is a red herring except when it comes to international trade, that's a different matter. 
So, if you have an isolated economy, there is no problem in managing it. You can, uh, you can uh, print as much money as you like up to the needs of the economy. There will be no inflation. Uh, your, the content of gold backing will re reduce, but this will not have any effect on the economy, contrary to what is widely believed by many. So the gold backing doesn't matter. Uh, so you can control the money supply, but if you are internationally linked, this same mechanism doesn't work. Because now, if you print money and you change the ratio of your uh, money to gold, then your uh, uh, the value of your money in international markets declines. And now, if your money is globally linked, then you can't use that money if you uh, to buy goods from the outside. So if the economy is isolated, there's no problem. Even in that situation, even uh, as long as you are self-sufficient economy, you can inflate your uh, currency and uh, you will be unable to buy foreign goods and it doesn't matter. But if your economy is highly linked and you buy your food from outside, then when you start your inflation to support your domestic economy, then you can't buy your foreign input. So you are put in a dilemma, either you destroy the, uh, either you maintain the gold standard and destroy your local economy by having too little money or you destroy your linkages to the international economy by providing enough money for the needs of the domestic economy. You can't do both. So uh, after the war there was simply not enough in, uh, money uh, globally. The war created huge amounts of debt and uh, nobody had the gold to pay these debts. So everywhere, uh, all the countries, they had debts and there was not enough money to pay these debts and so uh, countries started printing money. When you print money, you get inflations and you get hyperinflations and you don't get your uh, uh, stable currency. So in a lot of different countries, uh, the currency started being devalued, people felt the effects of this, they couldn't buy the goods that they used to be able to buy. And so a lot of places there were revolutions that, okay, what, and the revolutions were that we will put the, we will stabilize the currency. So this is a very strange thing that the, the, the claim to uh, politics came from um, the restoration of the currency and a very strange thing happened in Belgium and France and England, a lot of uh, the left is always, has always been popular and was very popular following uh, the Great Depression because uh, labor, uh, left supports labor. But in the public mind having a sound currency was more important than supporting labor because that was the axis of the economy as Polanyi says. So, in, in these places, Belgium, France and England, the left uh, leftists were thrown out of power because the uh, public thought that they will um, destabilize the currency by so trying to support labor. So uh, supporting the labor, getting the gold standard back in place was the highest priority of the population. So the attempts to stabilize the currencies were made but um, they were not successful and they were not su successful because the system itself had broken down. The, the surplus that was being produced could not find enough markets. The whole, whole system was based on certain ideas which were no longer functional. So when the currencies were destroyed, <coughs> buy, you know, basically uh, they said, okay, since uh, we don't have the linkage with the market economy, let's try to save the domestic economy. So they started printing money. Now uh, it's a, it was a strange mixture situation where linkage existed and was poor. So basically in Germany they said, okay, we will provide enough money to meet the needs of the domestic economy. So. Uh, however much is the needs of business we will print and so the needs kept increasing every day 
and uh, they started printing money every day and uh, hyperinflation took place. So um, what happened next was something which was new to the human experience. I mean the same, the um, monetary economy, the paper money concept uh, which is just printed by uh, by the government without any regards to um, any reserves was a new experience and it caused a uh, great change in um, the economic composition. So nations found themselves separated from their neighbors by a chasm. Yani in order to be able to have economic relations with your neighbor, you have to have a stable currency which is linked to the other currency. But if your currency is fluctuating and the other one is fluctuating by random amounts, how can you trade? You can't decide what, what is the value of this. You can barter, but it's much more complicated. So, um, a lot of people's fortunes were wiped out by these strange changes which had been unprecedented unprecedented and there was no no parallel in history and uh, the whole system of international trade was destroyed by this fluctuation of currencies a uh, new event that took place was the flight of capital so people who had wealth they realized that our money is going to be destroyed so they tried to convert it into assets and uh, assets which would uh, be real and sometimes they would take it out of the country in the fear that local domestic economy is being destroyed so the stronger economies uh, gained capital while the weaker economies lost capital so but when flight of capital place takes place that also causes uh, changes in the money supply which again have adverse effects on the domestic economy. So things were very confused and chaotic and complicated and uh, people reacted to this by uh, saying that we need a different type of government. The current type of government is not working. Just like Trump today is a, and Brexit in England, they, they, people realize the system is not working, let's change the system. Uh, Imran Khan here. <laughs> so, for a short period, about two decades in the end of the 19th century, there was a very well-functioning international system of trade and people uh, learned to trust it and utilize it. Uh, Self-sufficiency was abandoned, there was comparative advantage, food was flowing across borders. Uh, because of this, uh, populations were conscious of the currency and the system of trade, which normally people aren't if in self-sufficient economies. You don't care what's happening in England and Europe as long as our economy is self-sufficient. But if we are importing food from England, then it's a different matter. So, because of the, uh, so one of the very important things to understand about the interwar period is that there was a massive effort to restore the gold standard because that was the experience of people that the trade system works very well for uh, prosperity for everyone. And so this system has broken down and so they wanted to put it back together but it didn't work because of the numerous crises that we have discussed. So now one of the illusions that was very important and in uh, the efforts, see again we have to uh, there were other ideas around. There were, uh, it was possible to uh, 
develop an economy, an international economic system without using gold for trading. And even now, uh, the current economic system we have is an extremely asymmetric, unbalanced system which gives a huge amount of power to the USA because the dollar is, can be printed freely without any... So basically dollar is gold and the US has authority to print gold. Uh, and nobody else has that power. So it's a very asymmetric system. And uh, many suggestions have been made, including a recent one by Stiglitz, one was made by Keynes, but they have never been accepted because they all threaten the supremacy of the dollar and therefore would adversely affect US power. So there are, there are ways to divine the, devise the international system of payments so that there is a balance of trade and uh, all the currencies are symmetric in the system as opposed to one currency being infinitely powerful and everybody else being secondary. <coughs> but um, at that time, the dominant theory was that money is gold and it's, uh, unless you have gold backing, which is stable, you can't have international trade. And if you don't have international trade, then you can't have prosperity. So everybody tried very hard to put back the uh, gold system. But so he said that uh, the um, Polanyi is documenting that there was complete agreement on gold and uh, restoration. I mean, whether you were communist or socialist or capitalist, everybody agreed that money is gold and that we must have a stable currency, whether it's Russia or Austria or. England, whether you're a socialist or communist, this was a common point of agreement among all who were in Lenin and Churchill and Mussolini. They all agreed that gold standard is the only uh, correct method to uh, construct an international system. And this was the idea common to men of all nations, all classes, all religions, and all social philosophies. Even though this idea was wrong. so. This is uh, important to understand. I mean, the, this idea, this wrong idea, was a very important driver of history at that time. So, this provides some history of uh, despite a lot of effort. Uh, it was not possible. So there is a list of events that took place which basically uh, destroyed the gold standard. I mean, people tried, Britain tried to go on the gold standard. Other countries also tried to go back on the gold standard. But this tension, this basic tension between the domestic economy and the, and the international system prevented that from happening because the sacrifices that you had made. So suppose you say, okay, the gold standard. So it means that our currency is going to be now one-tenth of what it used to be. Now the way to uh, make up for it and the way it had been was that you get loans from the richer countries. And these loans give you the currency. Today also when we have shortage of money supply, we get loans from the IMF to make up for it. Uh, but at that time, uh, the IMF itself was in trouble. Great Britain was not, uh, um, didn't have gold to support the needs of international trade. And so, um, um, basically the sacrifice, I mean, the, the same problem today, the Greece, the austerity, it is again an issue of money. Uh, for international trade versus the domestic economy. And what, what is happening in Greece today with the austerity is exactly that the international traders are saying that you sacrifice your dis domestic economy so that the traders' interests, international bankers' interests are protected. And the other option is to sacrifice the trade to protect the domestic economy. But the international group is too strong to allow that to happen and that is the struggle that is going on. So at that time same struggle took place but uh, 
uh, the international system was not strong enough to enforce their will, although a lot of effort was made. Uh, and so eventually the domestic economy, I mean, you have a lot of starving people, revolutions, and so um, the, uh, England went off the gold and USA went off the gold and so ultimately, you see the gold uh, is needed by all economies, so everyone, um, and he basically they tried to access British gold. So Brit British was uh, bound or came under threat. They couldn't put, I mean, the demand for it was so high that they would be forced to devalue. They couldn't print enough to keep the gold balance. So they eventually they decided, now if they start printing money to satisfy foreign demand for uh, pounds, then they would have adverse effect on the domestic economy. So ultimately they decided to go off the gold standard and when they went off the gold standard, then the U.S., then all of this demand for gold was directed towards USA, which had a, and so the USA was forced to go off the gold standard as well. I'm just explaining this at, as a first pass in a very simple way. These are much more complicated things which we will discuss hopefully later on uh, when we discuss money. <coughs> So now this is the Polanyi point that the free market wants to have free trade and um, unregulated markets. Now, uh, but this causes harm to the domestic economy. So uh, there is this contradiction that uh, the market destroys itself. Uh, he says that basically, you see now the the all of this effort was trying to, um, being made in Europe, was trying to protect the system of free trade. But the only way to protect the free trade was to stop free trade by uh, basically creating self-sufficiency. Uh, the, that's the only way to protect your currency. Is uh, So a lot of things were done. There were uh, quotas and restrictions and embargoes on trade and there was quotas and restrictions and foreign exchange currencies. So basically, in order to protect yourself from the harmful effects of free trade, you had to close your economy and go off the market. And this is the basic theme of Polanyi, that the market is so destructive to natural society that the society tries to protect itself from it. And that disrupts the market, the free trade market. And this is exactly what happened, that the free trade system basically destroyed itself, led to a world war, and um, uh, then attempts to put it back together failed because they were having too much of an adverse effect and basically the whole system collapsed and people went back to autarky and self-sufficiency, all of these unfree trade ideas. But he said in the 20s the effort was made to preserve the system, in 30s everybody realized that this is gone, this is old and so now they went off the system and then they were uh, uh, 30s was revolutionary many many things that vanished he said basically the Rothschilds and the Morgans vanished from politics actually this was a mistaken idea of Polanyi but uh, they, they actually did uh, they had a loss a big loss but they prepared the ground for what they had to do but it is true that if you watch, I haven't uh, got the slide yet, but um, if you look at what happened to the share of wealth of the top 1%, then you find that after the 1930s, the share of the top 1% starts to decline, the share of the bottom 99% 90, starts to go up, up until the Reagan-Thatcher era, when the wealthy created a counter-revolution and uh, then they captured the global economy once again. So he says that there was complete destruction of the national institutions of 19th century society. This led to a crisis in great part of the world. These institutions were changed and reformed to serve different purposes, different ends, even the meanings of words were changed, what, what 
is individualism and freedom in uh, pre-World War era. Uh, these were all things that were subordinate to social responsibility. But in the post-war era, these became, these words had, had different meanings. Great nations recast the mold of their thought and buried their samzil to wars to enslave the world in the name of unheard of conceptions of the nature of the universe. And uh, even greater nations rushed to the defense of freedom, which acquired an unheard of meaning at their hands. So this is the, the first part of the book that the, the cataclysm which is the World War II which is the bloodiest war in human history and it led to a great transformation of society. Uh, it was caused by the effort for one century to set up a self-regulating market throughout the unrestrained market and this effort eventually destroyed itself. And so he says that the basic, uh, all institutions, that the fundamental uh, institution is the self-regulating market. And he says that the basic idea, the driving force of 19th century civilization, which is different from all other societies over all other times, is that they tried to make greed the single motive and the driver for all transactions in the economy. And uh, this motive is not acknowledged as valid in the history of human societies. Everybody in all societies, cultures, religions says greed is bad and harmful. But uh, 19th century civilization raised it to the being the greatest good and it was. Uh, and the idea of the self-regulating market derives from this principle. And as I have argued in my uh, paper, which is uh, the capital in, in crisis, uh, which is uh, basically um, explains the same ideas that how initially it was thought that the traders were not fanatics. The traders will, uh, they just want to get some more money. So even though it's a, it's a, a loathsome, it's an it's a inferior motive, it will not cause the same kind of uh, damage that the religious fanatics do, that they kill and murder and destroy, uh, at least in European history. But it turned out that um, the uh, death and destruction caused by trade was much worse than all of the religious people uh, in the world put together all of the fanatics, uh, even today, uh, the religious terrorism which is being touted as the biggest threat of the world and according to the newspapers, has killed uh, people in the thousands, whereas the uh, bombers for trade, for control of oil, have killed millions of people and destroyed nations and countries. So the free market is a much more violent and ruthless philosophy than the religion. Okay, so that we are nearly at the end. So, okay, so this is the end of part one of Polanyi in which he sets out the big stage and he says, okay, now I'm going to prove this thesis. He's just set out that this is my idea. He says, this is a very weird idea that I'm presenting that just this one factor, the emergence of the mar market has shaped history and, but he says, this is my thesis and I now I'm going to go through the details of why this thesis is true. So now we will... Um, um, in next week we will go through the part two of Polanyi which traces. So he says that basically market society was born in England and so we must look at England to study how the market start, uh, society emerged and evolved. Uh, industrial revolution was an English event. Free trade was invented in England. Gold standard was invented in England. And in the 1920s these institutions break down. Uh, so, if we look at the long run factors, we have to study the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, which was England. So, uh, that is uh, uh, for next time. And also, uh, basically, 
this is for up to date. I mean, Polanyi goes up to 1940, and we have to come up to the global financial crisis of today. So basically, uh, Polanyi had said that now this system is finished, a new system will come into place after World War II. And to some extent, um, this was true up until the 70s. Uh, but then uh, capitalists took again took control and now they are firmly in power and capitalism a system for exploitation of resources and now they are about to exhaust the resources of the entire planet and um, according to the ecological and environmental crisis this planet won't exist after I mean our planet will exist but actually human beings will not exist after 2050 or so because the rate of destruction of species and the oceans are polluted and the ice caps are melting and the atmosphere has changed and uh, species are dying at a rate that has never before been experienced in human history. I mean, every day some, uh, some species which took billions of years to evolve and come into place just goes extinct because of the rapid change. It's a very rapid change that is taking place in environment, in oceans. So um, it seems as if, and, and basically the lifestyle that is being um, projected in the USA is uh, one that the currently is using up resources which would take four planets to fulfill. I mean, it's, it's being exhausted at such a rapid rate. And uh, the dream is being projected that all of us, we must be developed. It's simply not, there are not enough uh, planetary resources. So the thing that needs to be done is to reverse this market mentality, to go back to a simple lifestyle, because that's the only thing that's possible. The way that capitalism works is by giving everyone a dream that here is a millionaire and a trillionaire and he has, you have this Hollywood which is projecting lifestyles which are simply impossible. But uh, you say that, let's play, a, maybe I will win the lottery and maybe I will go there. Now this is a, this is a delusion. I mean, 99.9, okay, .9, nobody makes it to that lottery. But they pick somebody and they put him up there and uh, they delude you into thinking the token black is a president. See, anybody, any black can become a president. So this uh, myth uh, keeps the system alive. If there was no hope that we could ever achieve the lifestyle, then people would become realists and they would say, okay, let's look at what we have and then let's look at what they have. So they say, don't look at what we have. Try to, uh, we, we won't put any obstacles to your progress. Let, let everybody compete. Now, the fact that this game is rigged, you can never win. This is not um, apparent. So people keep playing this game in the hope that I might win the lottery and I might become part of the uh, exploiters. So this is a different uh, mechanism from the Islamic mechanism of brotherhood and cooperation and mutuality. And this battle is taking place and we are losing badly. So, uh, but uh, we were sent to uh, participate in this battle and so that's what the game is all about. That's what this dunya was. It is a test for us to see which side you participate in. It's not a test of who wins or loses. It's a test to see that you will be given the choice between good and evil. And sometimes the good will look extremely harm, uh, hard. In fact, the Hadith says that towards the end of time, the Dajjal will come and in one hand will be Jannah. You can be like the uh, super elite and you can join the top 1%. But actually inside it will be Jahannam. Those who try for that will find that their life, family, everything is destroyed. And on the one hand will be Jahannam. So, okay, I don't ask anything. And I will seek to serve and I will live on the simplest possible way and inside that will be the Jannah. So if you, if you restrict your material ambitions and you look for the meaning of life in deeper things then you will find the inner contentment and satisfaction which you can't get with millions of dollars. Suppose that we were to give you a billion dollars which is supposed to be the goal of life. What would happen? Actually nothing will happen in the sense that uh, what makes people happy is personality, akhlaq, conduct and um, getting a billion dollars doesn't change your character. And so actually they have studied the winners of lotteries and they found that in inevitably winners of million dollar lotteries uh, have bad lives. 
because what happens is they move out of their poor neighborhood where they have community into rich neighborhoods where everybody hates them. Lots of people are coming insincere, want to be their friends. So they, they lose everything that makes for a good life in the illusion. So money doesn't buy happiness, but people are always thinking that money does buy happiness and therefore they are deceived. Okay, so that's all for today.